welcome to Dermatologist Talks Science of Beauty. Today, we're going to be chatting about what aging and skin aging really means. Dr. Tio, can you tell us a little bit about the science of skin aging and whether or not everyone ages the same? Aging of the skin is very much in tandem with the aging of other organ systems as a consequence of biological aging. The only difference, of course, is that the skin being external is a visible organ. And as a result, it's somewhat easier for us to assess when it undergoes certain changes. I think the important thing to understand is that biological aging itself is a natural process. And of course, your personal genetics can play a role. Skin-wise, individuals with more melanin, for example, in Asians, Hispanics, um, or essentially skin of color tend to age better. And that has to do with the innate photoprotective abilities of colored skin. That brings us to the second main driving factor of aging in general, and that would relate to environmental exposures. For the skin specifically, it would be ultraviolet radiation. We do know the harmful effects of UVA and UVB in terms of photo damage and also a lifestyle that is stressful. Chronic stress because of the hormonal dysregulation um, of a lot of our body systems can lead to more rapid deterioration of the physiological processes of aging. Essentially, all of our environmental assaults, um, for example, a 40-year-old encounters that um, is the same as what a 4-year-old would encounter because we are living in the same environment. But the differences would be in the um, terms of cumulative sun exposure and in the ability of the individual's uh, personal cellular systems to repair DNA damage. A four-year-old is exposed to sunlight and the 40-year-old is also exposed to sunlight. And on top of that, the sunlight he or she that has um, that she or she has been exposed to in the years prior. In the four-year-old, a very effective, efficient, and healthy DNA repair system quickly gets rid of any um, mutations that may form um, and also the pigmentation that arises as a result of melanin activation. This is in response to the free radicals generated when the skin is exposed to pollutants and UV radiation. In a 40-year-old, this process is much less efficient and this is when you may start to see the visible signs of surface aging. Can you tell us more about the factors that influence skin aging? Are there any habits that we should avoid? Other factors that would influence the process of aging would be the disruption in um, the circadian rhythm. These are still under the category of lifestyle factors. Lifestyle factors include chronic sleep deprivation and also links to your sleeping time. So if you are sleeping 8 to 10 hours a day and it's always past midnight that you go to bed um, and you consequently also wake up later in the day, that is actually less beneficial for you than if you were to pulse it according to the natural daylight and nighttime exposure. This is the same for all living creatures. Uh, physiologically, apart from the nocturnal uh, animals. We respond to daylight and nighttime is meant for a period of rest that helps our body recover. Being chronically sleep deprived or having irregular sleep hours due to chronic um, jet lag, constant travel, that will present to the body as a form of cumulative stress. Those are some really good tips. I think I have to start going to bed a little bit earlier now. Well, moving on, what are the different signs of skin aging in different stages of our life? How exactly is our skin different when we're 20 compared to, let's say, when we're in our 40s? A lot of people like to categorize the stages of aging according to your 20s, 30s, 40s, and onwards. Maybe five years ago, we were still talking about that. But today, I feel that it is a lot more important for both the media as well as the public to know that aging is not something to be resisted. 
and should not be presented in a way that could possibly be discriminatory. I think how this came about in the first place is largely because of the proliferation of aesthetic medicine. This is a worldwide phenomenon, and it very much has to do with the commercial interest of.、Um, Pharmaceuticals in the aesthetic、uh, medicine industry, fillers, toxins, laser devices, and、uh, other forms of anti-aging、uh, aesthetic devices. From a very honest and on the ground sort of approach on this manner, I would say that it was、uh, something fresh, novel,、um, new, and people were very excited when aesthetic medicine、um, arrived. So the thinking was more like that means oh I could inject the volume that I lost over this period of time for my age and and then you know it would be restored that's very impressive well and another person would think that does that mean my wrinkles can just be erased overnight、It's、sort of like a cheat sheet for、um, poor lifestyle and、uh, I guess、um, lack of a good routine that would.、Uh, Did prevent these signs from developing in the first place. Some time has passed since the advent of、uh, these treatments, of course, and it's a fairly mature、uh, industry right now. We we see that it's very widespread. These services are being offered in、uh, general practice clinics, aesthetic clinics, which are run by non non dermatologists, non plastic surgeons. And you know, in Singapore, you have to be certified by the Dermatological Society of Singapore if you're not a dermatologist and want to practice any of these cosmetic dermatology procedures. In fact, the majority of providers of aesthetic services in Singapore are actually general practitioners that have gone for these courses and are. Exclusively offering aesthetic services, which、um, was certainly something that was not common at all a decade ago, and also not in tandem with conventional practice of medicine, which focuses on the health of the individual. And general practice actually is first grounded in family medicine. I feel that culturally and in terms of the medical community in general, we are becoming a lot more aware of skin health, and the work of dermatologists in particular. Medical dermatology, for example, is the bread and butter for all dermatologists who are also practicing cosmetic dermatology. We are. Also, no longer just blindly focusing on reversal of signs of skin age. I prefer to set the note of the anti-aging landscape a little differently. I have basically described in the previous parts essentially the ongoing physiological processes involved in aging, and to sum it up a little bit more in an objective way, the rather crude. Aging scale that has been、uh, used for the last few decades, the Glogau Photo Aging Scale, is where we traditionally would reference to place an age range for the kind of skin changes observed from the twenties to the forties and beyond. Essentially, we are looking for the degree and severity of loss of skin elasticity, the presence of surface. Or deep wrinkles, pigmentary spots. These are all the outward manifestations of photo aging. What can we be adding to our skincare routine at different stages in our life? For example, is there a product we should be using our in our twenties that we absolutely should avoid when we're in our forties, and vice versa? In terms of what skincare products that one can add to their routine at different age groups, the main thing to understand is that the needs of skin at the age of forty versus when you are in your twenties are pretty much the same, except that for an individual who has neglected their skincare routine in their twenties and now at the age of forty, you would already have had the physical changes associated with photo aging. For example, deep wrinkles. Increased pigmentary spots, dehydrated skin, loss of skin elasticity, and then suddenly you are thinking, "Do I have to use something different?" 
I prefer to address the main principles because these are a lot more sound to work with. But in order to understand this, we first have to know what the requirements of skin are. If you start at the age of 25, it's best to approach it this way. First of all, your skin needs to maintain its primary function, which is the barrier function of skin. It protects your inside from the external environment, which is achieved via uh, having an intact skin barrier that is primarily composed of ceramide uh, produced by your uh, personal genetic mechanisms to act as a cement in the outermost layer of your skin. When that barrier function fails, either in someone with innate atopy, what we call atopic eczema or sensitivity, um, that you know is genetically deficient in these individuals, but it can also be an acquired form of barrier dysfunction due to the use of harsh cleansers, soaps. In someone who is 40 versus an individual who is 25, both categories of individuals require the skin to fulfill this very basic barrier function. Of course, with increasing age, there is an increased chance of the failure of the skin barrier. That's when you may think that the needs of someone who is in their 40s is different from another person in their 20s. But the reality is not as simple as that. There could be these underlying genetic and environmental predispositions that cause barrier deficiency in a much younger individual. And this advice should definitely not be translated to um, you know, a message that says there is a cream for a 20-year-old and a different cream for a 40-year-old. At the end of the day, if you were to simplify these concepts, the main thing is that in someone who is younger, you're going to expect a higher production of oil or sebum. That is the core difference, really, if you're talking about the difference um, in youthful versus aging skin in terms of how the skin behaves. This production of sebum certainly declines significantly as you grow older. An individual who is suffering from acne or seborrhea in their 20s, maybe all the way up to their 30s, um, they, they will certainly find that the problem goes away when um, they get older. Are there 40-year-olds who continue to have oily, greasy, seborrheic skin? Yes, but the general trend is that your skin produces less oil as you grow older. In this regard, you should consider using more moisturizing products when you're in your 30s and 40s, uh, especially if you have been used to skipping it um, or using very light lotion formulas in your 20s, living in a humid tropical climate like Singapore. This is also not to say that you should be using more different types of moisturizers uh, as you, you grow older, but in the amount that is applied to your skin. The skin is very efficient generally uh, when it's healthy at absorbing whatever is applied on it. And that's the beauty of topical therapy and dermatology because the skin, unlike the heart, the lungs, um, it's very accessible and drug delivery can also occur transdermally. Overall, if you are looking at someone who has significantly drier skin than another who has what we term oily seborrheic skin, you're going to differentiate between the, the various types of uh, moisturizing active ingredients. An individual in their 20s with seborrheic type skin would probably do well with a serum-based type of moisturizer. Um, or something with an emulsion base that's delivering separate ingredients, especially in a tropical, humid climate like Singapore. An important ingredient in a moisturizer would be ceramides, which is actually best carried in an emulsion formula in someone with slightly greasier skin and not so much in a cream or ointment vehicle as that tends to be a little bit too heavy. Polyglutamic acid and hyaluronic acid molecules are naturally present in the dermis. These also function as humectants, meaning that they trap water under the skin. 
It's very helpful to have these active ingredients when you are trying to regulate sebum production, and overall, uh, trying to maintain the skin barrier function to prevent transepidermal water loss. In an individual who is, um, you know, in their forties and really suffering from dry, dehydrated skin, one must not confuse that with the presence of wrinkles. We shouldn't say that one, you know, should add more moisturizer to address the wrinkle problem. The the thing here is, skin is a composite of functions. We've only talked about the barrier function so far, and when we talk about wrinkles. We're referring to the overactivity of the muscles under your skin. That, of course, is the result of age-related overuse. So, the more times you activate your muscles, the higher chance of hypertrophy. Just like when you're working out in the gym. So, if you're frowning all the time, by the time you're forty, you're sure to have these. Active corrugator and frontalis muscles, which will show up in terms of you having forehead and eyebrow frown lines and wrinkles. Well, someone in their twenties will also have that, but、um, these wrinkles actually are dynamic wrinkles rather than static wrinkles, which means that even when the individual is no longer using those muscles, say they are not frowning. Um, or raising their eyebrows, you still see the lines, mainly because of the connection between the muscle layers and the dermis, and also the epidermis. Ah, I see. That definitely makes a lot of sense. Well, finally, for our listeners, can you tell us a little bit more about your experience when it comes to your skin in different milestones of your life?、Um, how has your skin changed, and what have you done in terms of tips and practices in order to maintain it? On this note, we want to move on to what the true differences are in terms of addressing the conditions of the skin. If I may just share from my personal experience, in my twenties, I was very diligent with skincare and was also using a retinoid. However, when I entered my thirties, I found that I was no longer able to tolerate the retinoid formulas. I got a lot of irritation, and that's a common thing that occurs with a lot of my patients as well. I then switched to a pure peptide formula and the antioxidant cosmeceuticals, which are hydroquinone and retinoid free. I personally haven't had Botox or fillers done so far. I am now thirty six years old. I'm not ruling that out in the future, but I currently just want to see how it goes、um, with my current regimen of primarily cosmeceuticals. A preventive skincare routine and a healthy lifestyle. I exercise almost every day. I've done that for most of my life. I also sleep sufficient hours and go to bed by eleven every day, and wake up usually by seven or eight. For someone who has not、um, gone through this routine, for example, and is in the forties and suddenly sees all these signs of photo aging. What I want to say it is then no longer possible to revert back to the twenty state with just skincare alone, no matter the number or types of antioxidant ingredients they use. So the truth is, the damage has already occurred, and you actually need physical intervention to reverse it. And that's when treatments such as fillers address the loss of tissue volume and toxins, which relax the overactive facial muscles. High intensity focus ultrasound, also known as HIFU, helps to lift up the SMAS layer. If you imagine your entire face、um, and its composite tissues as a curtain system, the SMAS layer is essentially the reel that holds up everything. With that, I think we can, you know, thoroughly understand the premise of the various types of recommendations at different age groups that would be consistent with our understanding of dermatological science, and hopefully clears up any confusion that、uh, listeners may have about anti-aging interventions. That's really insightful, and I think that our listeners will be fascinated to know that there is such a complex interplay of various factors involved in aging. 
Well, thank you all for joining us. Dermatologist Talks Science of Beauty is a podcast that keeps you updated on the various developing perspectives in the field of dermatology, skincare, and beauty related topics. You may follow Dr. Tio Wan Lin on her Instagram at Dr. Tio Wan Lin, and remember to click on the subscribe button to stay updated on the latest episodes. We'll see you guys in the next episode. Thank you.